everyone. Good evening. What is sacred geometry? How can sacred geometry help with healing? If you've suffered from trauma, how can it help you? We're going to learn that and much, much more tonight. So in tonight's Get Off the Couch segment, we're a little excited here in the studio. I have to share. I'm engaged. We got the ring. Got the ring tonight. So woohoo! But this is what I want you to think about this week. When I was in high school, my dad said to me, when someone's asked you how you're doing, you should respond you're excellent, even if you're not feeling that way. And I was like, ah, teenager, not going to listen to that. And when I moved to Los Angeles, I really became and started the habit of doing that. And so when someone said, how are you doing? Even if I wasn't feeling great, I'd say excellent. And what I learned is that's a lot of times a conversation starter because people are like, wow, you know, most times when I ask how someone's doing, they always reply in a negative manner. And you're the first person that it's been really positive. So I try to remember to always be positive when someone asks how I'm doing. And if I don't feel that way, soon I'll feel much, much better. So this week, I want you to monitor and check out what you're saying when someone asks how you're doing and... Remember to think positive. Okay, let's tell you about tonight's guest. Elaine Groman is a certified healing touch practitioner, associate polarity practitioner, and an angel therapy practitioner. She is a developer and teacher of sacred sacred geometry and energy medicine, healing from the fourth dimensions, levels one and two. Her experiences of working as an energy healer, angel reader, and educator help us to begin to understand that we are never truly alone that life supports us and offers us insights and information about our journey. Elaine has an active private practice and is involved in helping the public and those in medicine, both nursing and medical students, begin to understand the importance of energy medicine, intuition, and the true meaning of healing, body, mind, spirit, and emotions. She's also the author of The Angels and Me, Experiences of Receiving and Sharing Divine Communications, and is working on her third book. Welcome, Elaine! having me we are excited to have you back she has been a guest before and we're super excited but let's get started what is sacred geometry well it is an actual ancient study of the patterns that are inherent in nature so back actually like i think as far as eight five thousand years ago they have evidence that other um civilizations were studying and employing geometry and and using these these patterns and these movements of energy to, in order to help to affect a change but the word sacred geometry actually came from the fact that great minds like Leonardo da Vinci, Plato, Pythagoras they studied in great detail what they saw in the natural world and they realized that everything was geometric in pattern so from the way the stars moved in the sky to the way that a plant unfurled from the ground, the way water moved, etc., was geometry. It was moving in a geometric pattern. And they coined the term sacred geometry because they realized they were studying the mind of God. They were studying uh-huh. all that was already in our uh, awareness, in nature, and so they were just experiencing and studying what was already there. And so what are the laws of sacred geometry? Well, there isn't an actual law other than to say natural law. So when we find and we look at the patterns that happen in nature, and, we, and we're wise, we follow natural law, meaning that we have seasons, We have times when things will grow and times when things need to be harvested and times when things will die. We have the beginning of the day. We have the middle of the day. We have the end of the day. We have a time of rest and a time of awakening. So that would be what would be referred to as a natural law. And these were not things that were um, invented. They were discovered just by watching, you know, the way you interacted with your environment and the way your environment was presenting itself. So the law, if you were to say that, would be just natural law. But so sacred geometry, like I studied geometry back in junior high. I didn't do too well. But did we lose sacred geometry or is it something that has gone on since the ancients have done it and it just a lot of people don't know about it? Well, let me let me qualify by saying geometry 
is in, and mathematics is not arithmetic. Mm. It is very different. Mathematics, actually, if you study back to the Mayans, who were the ones who developed mathematics, mathematics is a language. We, in our civilization, in our culture, we think of it merely as a computation method or a, a way of adding, of subtracting, of quantifying something. But mathematics actually is a science and a language. And this was a very sophisticated language that was understood and developed by, by the Mayans. And, and they were actually the ones who actually introduced the concept of a zero. Ah. So that, you know, at you and I both, as you're speaking, I was terrible in math. Mm-hmm. <laughs> math was always very intimidating yes. to me. I didn't understand what these symbols meant. Mm-hmm. You know, and then a problem also that I had was mild dys- mild dyslexia. So it was always very nerve wracking to me, especially with numerals, because it's hard when you're when you're trying to look at a mathematical equation and your numbers are flipping on you. OK, but I learned very differently from my childhood as an artist that shape is not the same thing as mathematics. So geometry is shape. In fact, the word geometry means the measure of the earth. Oh, okay. So then what, it, can I also say patterns, or is that an incorrect, it's more oh, shapes? Oh, no, absolutely patterns. So, you know, and, and they're all around us. So Starting could you give us our, some concrete examples of sacred geometry that we would see in everyday life? Um, a triangle, a square, a, te- de- tri- a dodecahedron, an octahedron, the stone that is in your, in your engagement ring. <laughs> that that is geometry okay so but what there's sh- what it, it, it's geometry is very important for structural things obviously Leonardo da Vinci many great minds even going into the 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 masons they understand that there is power inherent in shape now I don't profess to know that much about the masons but I do know that they know how to use shape in order to enhance a particular environment. So there's many things that that this is encompassing. It's a a huge, huge um, subject. So then would feng shui encompass sacred geometry? Because I know, for instance, I just did a workshop on organizing your office and I gave some feng shui tips and there are certain shapes to enhance the bagua in certain areas that are good and certain shapes that are bad. Well, I... I don't know very much about feng shui, so I can't really answer that. But I would presume that, yes, it has something to do with proportions and the, the, the way that the space is arranged. So, yes, you're using geometry in that regard. And, and energy is then moved. Actually, feng shui is a good way to think about it because they're, they're moving energy by, way, by the way something is positioned physically in a room. So if it's in a disarray, or if it's, if it's uh, not in the particular feng shui methodology, it might have a disruption of the energy. But the way that I use uh, sacred geometry, Julie, is actually in healing. So th- that's a great segue. And I want to remind everyone, if you have a question for Elaine, please chat it, and I'm happy to ask. Or you can call in at 919-518-9773 or Skype Computers 2K Voice. With all the violence and the turmoil that's going on in the world now, how can sacred geometry help bring balance to people? Well, you know, it's interesting that you asked that because I was just talking about a gentleman that I had the wonderful opportunity to meet in 2004 and 2005. Unfortunately, he's passed now, but he was a geometer. He was a mathematician, and he was the foremost authority on sacred sites and civilizations in the world. His name was John Michel. He was, a, he was an Englishman. And if, if you studied mathematics and geometry and civilizations, you would find that most healthy, productive civilizations were based on geometric proportioning. Hmm. So that goes down to the way that their villages and their towns were set up. Um, and but goes on from there so that mathematics and geometry, it, it kind of can get very complex, Julie, but, try to, but trying to simplify it is that there is divine proportion. There's proportions that 
um, create balance and proportions that create disimbalance. So ideally, in civilizations, what we need to do is actually to bring balance back into our world. So if you were to go back to a very basic geometric pattern, like the symbol that we know of feng shui, or excuse me, not feng shui, yin and yang, the yin and yang symbol, that is a geometric symbol, okay, of divine proportion, meaning perfection. So you see a, a circle, and within that circle are two what looks like paisley shapes, okay? Mm-hmm. That is the symbol of yin and yang, which means male and female energy, balance. So if we really kind of use that as a, as a metaphor for looking at how do we bring balance back to our world, that is what we're desperately in need of. So in all of the situations that we see around the world, we're clearly seeing imbalance. And a quick question from Essence. Can you define yin and yang? Is she's, she, or he asks, is it boy versus girl? But if someone's not familiar with yin and yang, can you define that? Well, yin and yang isn't versus anything. It is two things that complement. So in the human species, we have male and female. They're not against or opposite of one another. They're a part of the whole of humanity. So it would be really much more beneficial if we thought of men and women as complements of one another rather than opposing forces to one another. Now we've got a question here from Wick and Love. Can you cast spells with sacred geometry as I can with Wiccan? And can I find love using sacred geometry? Um, can you cast a spell? No. <laughs> no, you would not want to. Um, a, a sacred geometry, again, is looking at the patterns that are inherent in nature. So when you follow the patterns that are inherent in nature, you're going to bring a benevolent outcome. Okay, so, but if, I don't know that much about Wiccan, so I wouldn't want to answer that question because I don't want to mislead anybody. But I would say uh, the answer to that question is no. Could you use then, uh, follow up with that question about finding love? For instance, I know in feng shui, there are certain things you can do to find love or to get money. Could perhaps it be used in that way? Well, you know, let me, let me talk to you about another um, methodology that uses geometry. And it's an ancient understanding called a medicine wheel. A medicine wheel is an ancient body of knowledge from our Native American culture in the world. Medicine wheels are hundreds, of, well, not hundreds, they're probably at least 10,000 years old. So they have certainly have been around before any religions or things of that nature. So you ask the question about balance, okay, or finding what you want. There are are medicine wheels within medicine wheels within medicine wheels. But we have to start with the beginning of understanding ourselves. We often make the mistake of looking for answers outside of ourselves. But we always have to start with the self. So there's a beautiful uh, medicine wheel called the power of the human self. And... If you were to envision a circle, Julie, and this is both a teaching tool and it is a way of showing someone something, and you could actually make a physical medicine wheel, but it's only just to um, emphasize point. So imagine if you had a circle, and in the east of the circle, you would begin with a spirit, which is who you are. Before you have incarnated into this world, you are spirit. You come from spirit. You are a part of spirit. But spirit cannot know itself unless it has an experience in in a physical world. So the human self needs to have a body. So in the west of the medicine wheel is the body. So yes, we are animated by our spirit. But in order to have an understanding of who we are in relation to the world and those around us, We have to live in our body, but in so doing, we experience the world by expressing and reacting with our emotions. So the emotions would be in the south of the medicine wheel. 
So your body is animated by spirit and you understand who you are in relation to things through your, or at least you experience your world through emotions. Some have no balance in that. Some have no control over their emotions. Mm. But in order to have balance, you need to go to what's called the north, to the mind. So in order to have a full understanding of who you are as an individual, you have to have the spirit, the body, the emotions, and the mind in order for you to know the self. And I think that that is a beautiful, very eloquent, but simple understanding of some forms of geometry. Because we live in a world that moves. We live in our emotions that move. We live in bodies that move. And many people, I think, Julie, have the mistaken notion, again, that they can come to some kind of change in their life by seeking outside sources. That will never happen. It has to begin within. So to answer the question that your caller had, you can find love when you know who you are. Because when you know who you are, who that self is, then you will make much better honest choices, make better appraisals of situations rather than just to do something because you're wanting it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. And and I love that whole little um, last thing that you talked about, because one of the reasons I do this show is to empower people and for them to learn that they have all they need inside. And, exactly. and and to use that and find whatever path, whether it's sacred geometry, whether it's you know, um, a type of energy healing, whatever it is that will help them move forward in their life to, mm-hmm. you know, get over their issues and to live their life fully. Now, we have a great question here, kind of a comment. And I wanted to segue into this from Lisa Brown, who says, I'm interested in hearing about the energy healing involved in sacred geometry as yes. I use these in light body energy but didn't realize it for a long time. So can we talk about how you use sacred geometry and energy healing? Absolutely. In fact, um, I developed this methodology called sacred geometry and energy medicine level one and two. And I was asked to call it healing from the fourth dimension. So what that means, Julie, is we live and we experience the world through the veil of our emotions. And our emotions reside in time and space. And Einstein discovered or quantified or qualified the the dimension of time and space as the fourth dimension. So that helped you to have a little bit of an understanding of that. Because when we heal, we are healing not just our physical body, but we're healing our emotional constructs and how we deal with our life how we deal with situations and individuals. So the sacred geometry and energy medicine is really quite profound because our entire body is based on geometry, down to our very cells and our atoms. If you were to think of an atom, an illustration of an atom, which is a spherical uh, nucleus that has ellipses of movement Mm -hmm. around it, which is the magnetic field that holds that those neutrons and protons in place, neutrons and electrons, excuse me, in place. And if you were to continue on, every cell that divides in the human body begins as a sphere. So that sphere replicates. So when you imagine if you have a fertilized egg, for instance, the moment a, a, a female egg and a sperm meet and that, that egg is, is fertilized, Immediately, this beautiful explosion of geometry happens, a replication of the same patterning. So now, going further, we are beginning to understand that our bodies have what is called an etheric template. An etheric template is essentially a blueprint of the body. So, for instance, if you were to cut your baby finger, you would not grow an ear there you would grow another end of your finger. Or if someone had uh, a biopsy, let's say, of a liver, they don't grow stomach there. They grow a liver. Because our body has a pattern that it is able to follow that pattern, and it is very much like a blueprint. 
so therefore geometry. Also, because of the fact that everything in our body is driven by a neurological impulse, and that neurological impulse is a wave, an electrical wave that is still yet a pattern, okay? And it affects every cell in our body. So we have geometry that affects geometry that affects geometry that affects geometry. Correct. And we have a comment here from Debbie saying, like stem cells. Exactly. Like and, a stem cell. Now we had a, a stem cell is, is this magical thing that we know very little about, in fact. But the stem cell has the properties of becoming any part of our body. That's the magic of it. It's the wonderful thing about it. And they're trying to determine what is this part that can be employed anywhere in the body and then be kind of, for lack of a better way to say it, clicked into place in the etheric template and then become what it needs to become. So I have a question. So if you were working with a client doing an energy healing session, Mm -hmm. can you talk about how you would bring sacred geometry into it? Okay. When I'm working with a client, first thing that I do always is begin to ground them. And this is truly, Julie, is a whole other hour subject. Yes. <laughs> because most, most healers know very little about grounding. And it is essential for the human body. It is essential for a healer. It is essential for any person to be healthy in body, mind, spirit, and emotions. If they don't have adequate flow of energy in their body from Mother Earth, which happens to be a giant sphere, um, then we are not really helping ourselves for any long period of time. So when I begin, I open the chakras on the bottoms of the feet and I uh, move energy in patterns, essentially in making geometric patterns with my hands on the body to force the energy to move in particular patterns. When Uh, I have started to do this, I recognize that people have very profound and often very quick changes in their body. Because what it does is it reinforces the way energy moves naturally in the human body via the, um, our neurological system, primarily through the spinal cord, And that in itself is, if you look at this image of the caduceus, which is a symbol that the American Medical Association uses as their logo, that caduceus is a symbol of how energy moves in the body. And you see two snakes that that serpentine up a pole. Well, that pole is the human spinal cord. And the geometry that you see is this intersecting uh, serpents which represent not only a healer, but it also represents a pole of energy. Does that make sense to you? It does. I'm just kind of absorbing this. I have to be honest. This is probably, out of all the shows I've done, the most challenging to wrap my head around. (laughs) Well, okay. Well, why don't you just get rid of the notion of trying to understand the whole understanding of geometry and try to take little bits of it. Okay, so if you were to think back in to the mind of, let's say, Leonardo da Vinci or any, not just him, but many, many people who were brilliant and they were observers, how do they, how does science really understand the world? They understand the world by watching what is already here. Okay, so in the ancient world, they watched the stars move in the sky. They did it for years and years and years and saw that there were particular patterns of movement. All of these patterns of movements could be replicated or could be, could be documented, I should say. They would replicate over certain periods of time. And they were generally circles or ellipses or some kind of geometric pattern. Okay, As they started to look at the way, let's say, water would move down a cistern. It always would would create what's called a Fibonacci spiral. It's a perfect spiral, okay? They have understood then as we've gone through other courses of, of knowledge that things move progressively and all of that progression is geometry. 
even down if you were to look at even our molecular structure, if you've ever seen a diagram of a molecular structure, it is usually a hexagon or an octagon. It isn't a blob. It is a geometric pattern. So the, the five platonic solids, which were, they're called platonic solids because they were given their name by Plato, are a tetrahedron, and a, 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 let's say essentially that they're at a two-dimensional level would be a triangle, a square, a hexagon, a pentagon, an octahedron, and an isosahedron. Okay, so you might remember those from your geometry classes, but if you think about how everything is structured, if you look at a wall in a building, it isn't just an odd shape, it is a particular shape. It is geometry. So geometry is the structure that gives solidity and matter to our world. So this has been studied from ancient times. And what they have understood is that particular patterns of energy have particular, um, they do particular things. So for instance, if you were to look at the ancient pyramids, there was, these were not just happenstance that they decided to make something into a pyramid. They understood that these pyramid shapes would actually amplify energy, amplify energy from the earth. Some of these pyramids and some of these temples were used as temples of healing. So healing would take place using geometry in a spherical place or excuse me, in a structural way or actually in ways of moving energy. Okay. I'm, I'm absorbing it. It's a lot, it's a <laughs> lot to take in. And actually I want to remind everyone, if you have a question for Elaine, we have a couple questions on chat. I'm going to ask shortly chat in your question or call in at 919-518-9773 or Skype computers 2k voice. Debbie asks, can DNA be woven in a specific way with sacred geometry? Well, DNA already is woven in sacred geometry. It already is. And I think that that is what is happening when people, as a human species, as we're beginning to evolve, our DNA strands, I think, although I can't prove this, but physicists are trying to, to, to see what is happening, is the DNA is getting reactivated, for lack of a better way to say it. It is such a mystery. Can I, answer, I can't answer that question specifically because it is such a mystery that biochemists are looking at, physicists are looking at, neuroscientists are looking at. There's, this is a very complex thing. And it was not very long ago that they even discovered the DNA. But as we know, our DNA um, tells us everything about our body through our DNA. So there's patterns that are very specific to us as individuals, specific to family groups, specific to nationalities, etc. So then maybe let me follow up and perhaps this was our question. Can you use sacred geometry perhaps to repattern the DNA? Absolutely. Yes. Well, I cannot say that it would repattern the DNA. Okay. But I think it does. As healing occurs, using sacred geometry, then a change at the atomic level happens. So let's say if I am working with an individual that has chronic pain, for instance, and I am and, and I have asked them to, to measure their pain on a typical medical scale of zero to 10, zero being none, 10 being the worst pain that they can imagine. Typically, if I were just to make up a scenario, let's say somebody has a pain scale that they're measuring from their perspective as an eight. If I can start to move energy in their body properly, what that does is it starts to open neurological pathways that then send signals throughout the body that give that body information to heal. So as a person's vibration starts to raise, first of all, what people start to hear or feel is a little bit of a tingle in their body, okay? Tingling is a wonderful indication that energy is moving. 
As soon as there is a higher frequency in the body, often people will feel warmth. Because if you remember in basic science, Julie, that any friction creates heat. Heat creates warmth. And in the human body, that creates what's called vasodilation. Okay? So as I'm healing, multiple, multiple things are happening simultaneously. But if someone is in pain, and now I'm able to open up a pathway of energy so that their body is getting more neurological impulses and are getting more oxygenated blood, their body may have enough ability to relax to relinquish that pain. So that pain could go from an 8 to a 0 very quickly. Pain is caused by a constriction. So if you can move energy in the body in an effective way, which was what I find is sacred geometry does, and believe me, I, I actually studied this and did it on, on my clients for three years before I taught another person because I wanted to understand it so well. And every time I do it, I still learn mm -hmm. because every individual's body is uniquely their own and has had their own physiological problems. Maybe they have emotional things that they're dealing with, grief that they're dealing with, age, certainly many things contribute to someone's health or lack thereof. So, but it is getting energy to move properly through the body that will, I believe, affect all the way down to the DNA. Outstanding. Now, we've got a couple great questions for you on chat that I want to get to. The first is from me. Can you tell um, with sacred geometry why I've been tired lately? So would you be able to assess using sacred geometry why they're, they're tired? I would say without exception and without hesitation, if someone is tired, chronically tired, they are not grounded. Okay, so what that means is, this is a beautiful example here of, of geometry and energy. We live on a unique and beautiful planet called Mother Earth that is a living, breathing organism. And most of the time, we are so disconnected from the Earth, and yet we would not be here without it. We would not get our food. We would not have the materials to make our homes, and we certainly wouldn't have our air in the environment in which we can thrive. But most people are so in their head so much, and they're so out of balance that they become what I call ungrounded. So if I could give you an analogy, if you could imagine your two feet like the prongs of a plug plugging into the earth. If you are plugged into the earth, you will have a natural rhythm and flow of energy through your body, kind of like an inhalation and an exhalation that would allow your body to get the information it needs to go into natural patterning again. So the natural patterning is we wake up in the morning, we have periods of, of rest and and uh, a bursts of energy during different parts of the day. Obviously, we need to eat well. And then back in the ancient times, people knew when it got dark that it was the end time to rest. But the problem is we have no, we're, our cycles are out of whack right now. So I would say without, without exception that this caller, if they're chronically tired, more than likely they're ungrounded without exception. You know, that's very interesting. And you were the first person that taught me a very different grounding technique than I had been taught before. And yours was like night and day. Cause I remember you, when we were doing it, you're like, do you feel tingling? And I'm like, yes. And so mm -hmm. it's a, it's a mm -hmm. great technique for people to learn. Now we've got a couple questions from Lisa Brown on chat. I want to get to her first one is, is your basis on the scientific aspect or on an intuitive level of consciousness when you work? Both. Absolutely both. So I am, I'm very privileged to work with a lot of people in medicine. I have a very wonderful neurologist sitting right next to me right now. Mm -hmm. So that um, I, I do both. I, I use my intuition all the time. I use my senses to feel what I, am, what I am observing. And I use that power of observation to help give me information. Okay? I watch the person. 
how how are they relaxing what is their what are the respirations doing how is their skin color is are they pinking up do they look like they're feeling a little bit less distressed so you're yes you're using obviously your observation but yes i do use my intuition but one of the things i feel very responsible to do julie is when I am working with somebody, let's say, that has a particular diagnosis, I do everything in my power to find out as much as I can about that disease process. Because I want to know, if I'm seeing things intuitively, I want to know what that disease tissue looks like, and I want to know what that healthy tissue looks like. Because my goal is to get it back to that healthy flow, to get that body to be as healthy as it is possible in that age, in that... Uh, whatever it is, I, I want to help someone be at their optimal. Now, she, Lisa also asks, what within you drew you to sacred geometry? Well, it was an interesting thing. I really didn't seek it out. It sought me. <laughs> if I can tell that story, I was actually, um, I had already become a polarity therapist. So I had been doing healing work for quite a while doing polarity therapy I was in the process of becoming a certified healing touch practitioner. And in that, excuse me, in that modality of, of healing touch, you have to work with a mentor. And it, it should take you about two and a half years if you're not rushing it. You're not doing yourself much good if you're rushing because you really need the experience. And I was meeting with one of my mentors. I had two mentors one who is one of the founders of Healing Touch International, a brilliant woman who is an RN PhD. The other one was a local person who I was working with who was a very gifted and intuitive, very gifted healer, and a very compassionate individual who had come from um, one of Fortune 500 companies, so was obviously very intelligent as well. And as I was uh, uh, meeting with her, I, I literally had gone to her door I, she was going to review some of the papers that I needed to send in for my certification. And she opened the door, and she has these startling, beautiful blue eyes. And she opened the door, and she had just tears rolling down her face. And I looked at her, and I said, are you okay? And she says, yes. And she had this beautiful smile on her face a moment later, and I said, then why are you crying? She said, because I just had the most extraordinary meditation. And I said, then why are you crying? <laughs> and she said, because, you know, it was just so beautiful. And I, can, and I said, well, can you tell me what it was about? And she said, it was about you. And I said, oh, okay. And she said, I was told by a group of beings to give you these particular books. And she handed me these three books. And I said, what is this? And she said, this is sacred geometry. And I said, why are you giving it to me? And she said, because these beings said, you have to teach this material. So that's what started me on this journey. And I looked at those books, and I remember flipping through it, and I thought, oh, I know this. I remember this. And even as a child, Julie, I was always fascinated by shapes. I always struggled with the mathematics of it, but I understood how things went together. Why, I don't know. I just had an aptitude for it. And, and as I started to then kind of put aside the other modalities that I had learned, I, I was hearing a lot of divine guidance. And as I worked with people, I would hear, put your hands here and watch. Put your hands here and watch. And, and literally for three years, I diagrammed every experience I had. What I noticed, what would happen, how the client responded, and what the aftermath was. And after three years, then I felt I had, enough, I had enough information to begin to start to share it. So that was in January of 2002, I started to teach Sacred Geometry and Energy Medicine Level 1 for the first time. We've got a bunch of questions here for you, Elaine, on chat I want to get to. Debbie says, I have used ge geometric crystals to grid on a fifth dimensional grid template. What are your experiences in using sacred geometry in gridding? Very little. <laughs> um, I am really wanting to learn more about crystals. 
and I have some friends that are actually wonderful gemologists, the who, one who actually happens to be a medicine woman, and understands the frequency within a stone, how to use a stone particular, in particular ways on the body, and what it can do. Um, I am not really familiar with this grid that this individual is speaking about, so I really can't honestly answer that. I don't want to speculate without really knowing exactly what she's speaking about. But I do know that you can use crystals to amplify energy. We already do that just looking at this computer screen that I'm looking at now. And in any, any many, in, in many telecommunications uh, instruments and tools that we have, use crystals to amplify information. So just in that alone, and these are minuscule ones, can you imagine what happens if you're standing on a mountain of granite? Very powerful medicine happens there. Sissy asks, can you do a quick grounding technique? Yes, absolutely. Um, the easiest thing to do is I would suggest that people just sit with their back straight but not rigid, with their feet flat on the floor, and I often suggest to people that they close their eyes just so that they can be more internal for a moment. So if you would, just close your eyes and imagine that the tips of your fingers and the tips of your toes are open as if they were like straws so that energy can flow out. And imagine, if you would, that right on the arch of your foot, each foot are without exception in my mind, the most important chakras in the entire body. And right on those arches, imagine you could see in your mind's eye what resembles the closed lens of a camera. And imagine you could watch these camera lenses slowly begin to dilate. And as they dilate, they stay fully open. They do not close. And just begin to notice what you feel as those chakras are open. Because what we understand about our physical living Mother Earth is that she has a gigantic magnetic core. And she has what is called a torus. And a torus, so now the, the Earth itself has poles, like our body has a pole, negative being the opposite of positive, negative not being bad. We have a north pole and, an, and a south pole that has a negative and a positive charge that constantly is moving energy through the earth herself. And from that, any electrical impulse creates what science has already proven. It creates a magnetic field. So just like the human body has an aura, which is actually the electromagnetic field of the human body, the earth also has an aura, but it's called a torus. It's in the shape, a geometric shape, by the way, called a torus. So as a torus is a movement of energy from the north to the south poles and up through the center of the earth. Just It replicates exactly what happens in the human body. So when you are grounded, when your feet are grounded, you're allowing this energy to move through you much more effectively. As it does, then you're literally connected to this supercharging battery, which is living, called earth. But most of the time, people are so disconnected from themselves that, and their environment that they have no idea how to stay grounded. But one way to determine whether someone is grounded is, number one, are they healthy? Are they calm? Can they stay calm in re, in, and not react to um, different situations? Are they able to make good judgments? If they're just reactionary, guaranteed they're not grounded. If someone flies off the handle in a, at a moment, they're definitely not grounded. I think that's, that's fantastic. And again, I think this is something simple that people can do that obviously the detail you've gone into can make a huge difference. It's really essential, Julie. I believe it's really essential. And when I am working with my clients... And I tell this to when I'm talking to the medical students, when I'm talking to medical faculty, anyone, whether it's the mother of a, a, a child that I'm working with or it's the, 
a neurosurgeon <laughs> or a neurologist sitting next to me here. I, I, I want people to understand how to be responsible for themselves. Because if we're really going to change our world, Julie, if we're really going to be healthy as, as men and women, and then from that as a society and as a species of being, we have to be self-responsible. Now, at least, we, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, please. Lisa wants to know if you can recommend a great book on sacred geometry to someone who is not scientific minded and more intuitive, right brained or a website or a resource. It would depend on what it is that they're interested in learning. If they're interested in learning, I would suggest taking a class. I travel all over and take and teach classes. This is this is an experiential um, workshop. When you feel energy move, then there's no doubt that you know that it exists. When you feel energy stop pain or to help something heal quickly, then you understand energy very differently. But yes, there are some books that are out there. There is one, um, there's two actually, it's called The Ancient Secrets of the Flower of Life. It is um, by a man named Drumvolo Melchizedek. Um, it gives you a, a wonderful understanding of the history and the science of geometry. But it doesn't necessarily talk directly about what I'm speaking about in terms of how do you use this to heal. But I think that it is a very important uh, modality to use because it has very quick responses. And we need that. Now, that brings up a couple questions people had. One from Butch was, how can I get involved with this? And Essence wanted to know, can anyone learn sacred geometry? Now, again, I'm going to quantify it as sacred geometry and energy medicine. This is what we're talking about. Because the concept of sacred geometry is very big and very broad. But, yes, anyone can learn healing. Anyone can learn how to use sacred geometry and energy medicine because it is an innately human ability. But does that mean that everyone has the aptitude or the desire? No. But if you wanted to, you could. But you have to understand that there's going to be some people that are going to have a greater aptitude. In fact, someone just asked me this the other day. And my way of explaining is anyone could probably learn music, learn how to play music, learn how to read music. But some will struggle and some it will be like nothing. It will be so easy for them. So there's, there's degrees of learning, but I think that when people really have a heartfelt desire and want to do it for their own betterment, absolutely, they will pick it up. Well, I would say that it's probably, I would struggle. I've learned energy medicine, so maybe, but... but I, I don't I, think I, you would, Julie, because I, I, I honestly, I cannot think of one person, quite honestly, that I have ever taught that really didn't feel it. Okay, I trust you In on fact, that. Yesterday I had a young man here. I work with a, a local university medical school here in the Detroit area. And I was working with this med student, and they, I have med students that come and shadow me. And when he felt energy for the first time when I was working on him, literally tears were just forming in his eyes. And he looked at me and he said, why aren't they teaching this in medical school? And I said, I wish I knew. Go ask your instructors. Why aren't they teaching this in medical school? Well, they should be. And my hope is that with the work you're doing and others are doing, that we're moving in that direction. That's right. Because everything in the body is animated by energy. Because everything that everything in our body is get it, is information comes through our neurological system. But the neurological system is just the conduit. It's like the wire in your house. But you need to have that electricity in order for that wire to do something, right? Mm -hmm. If you have, if you don't, if you have a light that's not plugged in, you're not going to be able to turn that light switch on, no matter how many times you flip it on and off, and on and off. It's not going to work. <laughs> it has to be connected, and that is how we have to be. We have to be connected to this earth in order to really heal. Well, Doctor Oz has talked about, and I'd call him mainstream. I mean, he's a oh, pretty well-known figure, 
And he said energy medicine's the next frontier, and he's, you know, vocal about it. He's not whispering it. He says it pretty loud. It actually is interesting. I was just having a conversation with my friend about that, and I missed the episode today. But and I never get to see it, unfortunately, but I, I saw a tail end of that. He was today was going to have a medical intuitive on, oh. which is extraordinary. So to be a medical intuitive is really someone using all of their intuition. But I want people to understand to use your intuition means you're using your senses appropriately. Sense of smell, touch, feel, taste. And also what you intuit, what you what comes into your mind, the images that come into your mind is very important. I read that sacred geometry is valuable because it's a meditation for the logical side of our brain. Do you think that's true? Could you comment on that? Well, it's interesting because at the on, onset, somebody had asked something about a, a man or a mandala. What most people don't realize is that when you look at something like that, this beautiful geometric pattern, what they're beginning to do understand in, in neuroscience is that if you meditate on a particular pattern, just by looking at it and paying attention to it, it actually opens parts of the brain that have been dormant. So the, interestingly, in the research that I have done about sacred geometry, and I believe it was 500 A.D., the Emperor Thelodius forbid the study of sacred geometry because it was so powerful. Wow. Yes. And there were whole temple schools and mystery schools that that's all they did was study geometry, study sacred geometry. Even in the United States of America, Chaco Canyon, which I believe is in New Mexico, it's either New Mexico or Arizona, was a temple school there. It, the ruins are still there. And it was an ancient Mayan and Azteca temple. Now, I want to, I want to clarify, the term temple does not mean church. A temple in ancient times was equivalent to a university. So a temple school was an institution of higher education. A mystery school was an institution of higher education. But we have a lot of misunderstanding of language in our world right now. So a temple is not like a synagogue or a church. A temple was a, was a place of great thinking. So those even were based on geometry. They were designed using principles of sacred geometry. Every cathedral you walk into is based on sacred geometry. Because the intention of a cathedral is to alter your experience. The, 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 the intention of a holy place is to alter the experience of the person in that place. How? And, Go ahead. And, and there was a lot of evidence to show that people that were masons, that understood using stones, natural stones, that they would amplify the, they amplified the experience because they had quartz crystals in it, which again are geometry. How can, now I know you teach... It's sacred geometry and energy medicine. So you teach two levels of that. And Correct. then once someone learns that, are they certified? And then they're able to, to use that to help people heal? Well, I, I, I don't have a school yet. Okay. But I've been teaching this for 12 years or for 10 years, 11 years. And um, maybe someday I'll have a school. But, you know, my understanding is, you know, once you learn this, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. Do it on your family. Do it on yourself. Do it to help yourself as much as you can. I use it all the time. I use it with my family. I use it with my grandchildren. They love it. They always say, Nana, heal me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's wonderful. great. That's wonderful. Starting out young, they're going to be much better prepared and much happier 
if they're That's experiencing right. this at such a young age. And I have two questions I like to ask everyone. The first is, what advice would you have to people out there who are struggling right now? You know, might have lost a job, gone through a divorce. What advice would you have for someone in tough times? Be honest. Be honest. If you're in a tough situation, first of all, you have an opportunity to look at this as perhaps an opportunity for you to change, to find something that will really be rewarding in your life. If you blame everybody else for the circumstances, you'll never get out of those circumstances. But I think that you have to be really honest with yourself about if there is any discord in your life, how are you contributing to that? What is it that you are doing to make that maintain that constant irritation in your life? Can you just forgive the circumstances and go on? That's what I would say. Be honest. Okay. I love that. I think that's very wise. Now I'm all about getting off the couch. So what one step can they take right after the show, tonight or tomorrow morning, to reawaken their brilliance and take some action? Well, go outside. Right now in Michigan, we had a heck of a lot of slow last night, but it is so beautiful and magical out there right now. Go outside and look at what is supporting your life. It's not just a drudgery to have snow to plow or move. It's magic. You're looking at water. You're looking, what I would say, Julie, is people need to have a different appreciation for what is around them. And when they do, they wouldn't discount it so easily. Mm -hmm. And then they would understand that there is this intimate connection with we ha that we have the with the world, and we really, really need to get that back. I love and that. And then we, then we would appreciate our lives different, and we would treat our environment and our resources very differently. I think that's, again, very wise and very true. Now, Lane, tell us how we can find out more information about you, if you have any of these wonderful classes coming up, and is your third book out yet? No, I'm still working on the third book. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a pivotal book, so I, I need to take my time. Um, but people can get a hold of me at my website, which is elainegroman.com, E-L-A-I-N-E-G-R-O-H-M-A-N.com. Or they could reach me at 248-855-3456. I'm in Farmington Hills, Michigan. I'm going to be teaching sacred geometry and energy medicine in, in the Chicago area. And if people wanted to go to my website, they can look on the link that has events and workshops and they can see where I'm teaching. And I would, I'm happy to travel. I travel a lot. If someone wants to coordinate a workshop, it's a two day workshop. I'll come and teach. Fantastic. Well, maybe we'll get you here in the triangle area. I know uh, some of the people who are watching tonight are healers and I'm sure would love that. I would love that opportunity. And I've read both of Elaine's books. They're very great. I would recommend both of them. And if you're still, are you still doing readings? Oh yeah. I she is uh, one of the best readers I've ever, I've ever been to. So I can highly recommend her for that. And thanks for having us on again or being thank on the show, you. I should say. And yeah, thanks for having me on honey. <laughs> and well, get your third book and we'll have you on to talk about that. And great. you have, I now understand sacred geometry much better. So I'm much appreciative. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. All right. Well, everyone, I want to remind you, for those in the Raleigh-Durham Triangle area, our Thrive event is next Tuesday, March 5th. So if you're stressed out and need to learn how to manage stress and reduce your anxiety, come here. Our Body, Mind, Spirit expert panels do that. This is the last time we're going to have the special of a free acupuncture treatment and visit and chiropractor visit because I've got two people who are on board that want to help you live your best life possible so for more information, go to reawakenyourbrilliance.com for that. And it's sponsored by Delta Force Technologies. And we'll see you all here back next week. Bye now. Bye-bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Sundays 9 a.m. till noon, Carrie's Psychic Cafe, 
with Carrie Silkowski, Sundays 8 till 9 p.m. Health In with Debbie Brooke, Mondays 11 a.m. till noon. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Mondays 8 till 9 p.m. One Chic Mama with Mary Michelle, Wednesdays 4 till 5 p.m. Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, Wednesdays 9 till 10 p.m. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by thatvidblasterguy.com, carolinaapparel.com, and deltaforce.net.